the result from that somewhere at least once, and boom, you, you find it. But that doesn't use math. That uses the rule of complementary patterns. Let's find a, a math approach to do this, okay? Okay, so the first thing we do is let's define the wrench vectors. You know, you take, you, you find the f vectors of all these, you make it the first three, and then you take the r vectors, the location vectors, the points to all of them, cross those with the f vectors, and that's the last three. Um, again, you'd add those to q times f, but q is zero for this, right? And so, you know, I'm just, you're just using this equation right here uh, to make, find the first three and the bottom three. And, and there you go. Here's omega 1, here's omega 2, here's omega 3, here's omega 4. Uh, at home, check my math, make sure uh, you know what you're doing and that you see how these four correspond with those four, okay? So now, let's, what we want to do is you want to linearly combine them, okay? You want to add them all together and allow f1, f2, and f3, the scalar values, to be any real finite number and it will generate a wrench constraint space vector. This is just a 6 by 1 vector. But again, it's got all these independent magnitudes in it from these guys, four independent magnitudes um, that can be any real finite number, but represented in a single six by one vector. This is the wrench constraint space. This mathematically somehow represents this, you know, th this is the visual depiction of this mathematical vector. Okay, and let's, let's see how we could interpret that. Okay? Well, Okay, so let's just look at that here, right there, on the right. And, and again, remember, we linearly combine these. these the linear combination of these um, is, is represented by this. And this may contain a ton of stuff that's not just blue. We're, we're really only interested in pure force wrench vectors because when you're designing parallel flexure systems, you don't use the orange wrench or the pure moment or anything because these wires can't impart those things. So you only care about the blue space the blue wrench, you know, the, the Q of zero uh, things. And, and th there's no guarantee that this linear combination will just generate blue lines. But we only care about finding the blue lines. So what you need to do is filter this out. This contains all the orange, all the black, and all the blue lines with any Q value. You want to find just the ones, interpret the spaces in this space, um, or in this mathematical representation, or you want to just find the spaces that are blue. So to do that, what you would do is you would, you would say, okay, so here is the f vector. It's going to be those three components, one, two, three, okay? And then the, the tau vector is going to be these three components, right? One, two, three. And you dot product them both, dot product these both, and divide them and set it equal to zero, okay? Well, you don't really need to care about the denominator because if the numerator is zero, then it's zero. So you just dot product f with tau. And you find if you dot product f with tau, do that, line up corresponding components, multiply and add them, you'll find this must equal zero. Okay? So every so anytime this condition is met, okay, within this space, you will be able to find uh, the the visual spaces within the, the constraint space that are pure force wrench vectors. Okay, so let's look at the first condition. So this could be zero if f2 is just zero, or if f3 plus 4 is zero. Okay, so so right because as, you know if this is zero then this whole thing's zero. If this is zero, this whole thing's zero. So those two things um, are conditions we can meet. So let's look at the first. The first condition is if f2 is zero. Okay, For, forget about this. Okay, let's just say if f2 is zero. Well, then what happens to this space? Well, it turns into this, right? Because f2 goes to zero here, and then here's all the rest. Okay, so here's the full constraint space for the condition when f2 is zero, which means it guarantees this is some. The, when, we, when we geometrically represent this, it'll be some space that's filled with only pure force blue wrenches, okay? That, that, that satisfy the condition, okay? So, but let's interpret this. If we break this out into its f vector now, what we know is that this is, no matter what f1 and f3 and f4 are, this is something in the x direction, and then the y and the z direction are zero. So that means everything in this space that is blue, and everything in the space has to be blue because we enforced it with this condition, um, everything in this space will be parallel and point in the x direction, uh, parallel to the x-axis, because it can't have a y or a z component. Okay, so that's already useful. And then what about the, um, you know, if, if we then calculate the possible location vectors of this wrench, um, you know, if you, by doing that matrix thing and plugging in the q of zero and plugging in these things for f and these things for tau, 
and, and do all that stuff, you would find, trust me, it's, it's not worth showing, um, you would find that the R vector can point anywhere in space, okay? Okay, so let me ask you this. What shape has an R vector can, that can be anywhere um, that, you know, only has blue lines that are all parallel to the x-axis? Well, that's the box, right? So anytime F2 equals zero, it's the box. If F2 is zero, this space, you know, visually can be depicted by a box. Okay? Well, let's look at the other condition. What happens if F3 plus F4 is zero? Well, that's another way it can be just pure blue lines. Um, but let's now plug that in here, and you see that if F3 plus F4 is zero, then the top thing is just F1. This is still F2. This is zero, zero. F3 plus 4 is zero. And then F3, let's see here. Uh, yeah, then you can you know, plug that into here. You can see F3 equals negative F4. Plug that in here, and you get 2F4 down there. Okay, So you can see how if this condition is that, they're all guaranteed blue, and this is the new s shape. Okay, Well, if we look at that, you can see here the new shape has you know, points, has lines of action. Let's look at the first three that point in the x and the y direction, but not in the z direction. So it's going to be blue lines that are perpendicular to the z axis. That's one clue, okay? And then if you do this trick to find the R vector, remember here's that matrix I showed you before, okay? You plug in Q is zero, and you plug in here's the F, and those three are the bottom three there, and then you take this and multiply them through, or this is all review from lecture two, you get these three equations, okay? Now look, it's possible if F1 and F2 are zero, which they could be and still have F4 not be zero, then RZ could be non-zero. But here's the thing. If F1 and F2 are zero, then F4 has to be zero because 2F4 equals zero has to be F4 is zero. So that means F1 and F2 can't be zero because according to these equations, so would F4 and then this would be nonsense. So at least one of these has to be non-zero. And so from this, you can know that RZ has to be zero. Okay. And then, so RZ has to be zero, but then from this, RY and RX can be anything else. Okay, so we have the final clues. So we know that for this condition, when the shape is filled with all blue, blue lines, that it points, all the blue lines are going to point perpendicular to the z-axis, and their R location vector can be any RX and RY, can point anywhere in the RX, or the X and Y plane, but it's R, Z has to be zero, okay? So that means the R vector has to lie, it can point anywhere on the X, Y plane. So what has location vectors that can point anywhere on the X, Y plane uh, that have directions that are perpendicular to Z that are all blue? Well, that, that represents this filled in blue plane, okay? So remember, there's, there's two geometric shapes within this constraint space. There's the box and there's the blue plane that's all filled in. And we just interpreted when this one is zero, it's the plane, and when F2 equals zero, uh, it's the box. Okay, so that, that's one way to uh, interpret this, right? Um, um, uh, th yeah, that, that's one way to interpret this. If, if I give you a bunch of wrenches, you can linearly combine them, filter them out to make sure there are, there are no orange or black ones in there, they're just all blue and then use the math like I did in this to interpret what the shapes would look like visually and you can kind of prove it just from logic, okay? And you would find that the shapes you generate mathematically are the same as the shapes that if you use the rule of compromise patterns to find all the red lines intersect all the blue and all the blue intersect the red, that you get the same thing, okay? Okay, so now, I mean, if you understand that, you really understand the math of what's going on behind the hood here. Um, but uh, again, what if I just gave you this shape and you didn't know how many independent things were in it. At some point, you're going to memorize, you know, like in a disk, there's two things in it. In a plane of parallel things, there's two things in it. In a box of parallel things, there's three things in it. You know, pretty soon you'll, you'll memorize all these so you'll know. But say, say you didn't know and you just had math to rely on, and I said, how many of these things were independent in there? Well, what you could do is just grab a bunch of these from there. You know, uh, say we take gosh, these five from the box, and really these two from the plane, 
you know, these, these, there's five in the box shown here, but there's also three from the plane. So just pick a bunch from each of the shapes. In this case, one, two, three from the plane, one, two, three, four, five from the box. Okay, so in this case, we have a, a good, you know, six wrench vectors that we've picked um, kind of randomly within there, and uh, we're going to define them. There's the, you know, the original four that I did in the last example. Um, you know, right, right, this, here's, here's the four, okay. Um, I, I have the same four in there, so I would, why resolve those? Then the new ones, omega, W5 is that one, and W6 is that one, okay. Again, check my math, go home, don't, don't trust me, uh, construct all these wrench vectors, make sure you get the same answers as me, okay. So now that you have these six wrench vectors, you can plop them in a, um, just take these guys and plop them in a matrix, and then do Gaussian elimination and to find out how many of these were actually independent. I just took a bunch from the space, made vectors, and I'm going to do Gaussian elimination. So again, let's move that up there. Okay, this top row is already all zero, this bottom row is already all zero, and this one's already moved over. So what we want to do is compare the top and the third row. You times this one by negative F1 divided by 3 to all these. Okay, and then you subtract it, or you just add it to this. And this would go to zero, which is the whole goal, and these would be that, okay? And then, you know, you just keep, anyway, I'm not going to, you can check my math in this, but you just keep going, and now we got rid of this one, we, we compared this row with that one, got this, okay? You compared this row with that one, got this, compared this row to that one, got this, so now they're all zero, now you got this. Now you got to compare these rows to bring this to zero, so you got that zero, you got to compare these rows, you got this to zero. Now you've got to compare all these rows, and these, this one, will, you can see very quickly, this all goes to zero very quickly. Okay, so, so here you end up with, of your six vectors, one, two, three, four, five, six, four remained unable to be brought to zero. In other words, four pivots where everything else is zero. These two rows were the de dependent vectors. Uh, they, they're, you know, only four are independent, okay? So that, that proves, once again, that from that constraint space of that example, only four were independent. So that's how you could tell how many independent things are in there. Okay, so uh, again, if, if this is freaking you out with the math, don't worry about it. You're, you're not going to use math. I, I just want you to understand uh, the math under the hood of the fact approach. But the nice thing about the fact approach is you don't need to know any math. Uh, if you just know these shapes and how many things are contained within them, you're familiar with them, uh, you can analyze and design anything and not be very intelligent. I mean, if you just know the shapes, you can, you can, they give you all the answers and all the numbers, and you can just wow and impress your friends and design uh, amazing flexures that no one else could think of without knowing this knowledge, right? So, so but I, I want you to understand the math behind it as well, okay? But, but again, you can get 100% on every exam if you don't fully understand the math. You know, it, it, certainly if you don't know how to do Gaussian elimination, don't don't worry about it. You know, but but I do strongly recommend you learn Gaussian elimination. Okay, um, <clears throat> okay, that could be on an exam. I, one question I could say: Do Gaussian elimination on this this thing, this matrix? So so look 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 that up. How to do that? Kind of self teach yourself that one. Okay. All right, so this next topic is subconstraint spaces. Um, it tells you how to pick your constraints from a constraint space to make sure they're independent. Okay, so remember this shape, it, it consists of a box and it consists of a blue highlighted plane, okay? Um, and we found from the last example that there's four non redundant constraints within there. Well, um, just knowing that this is the design space and knowing you have to pick four to be non-redundant or exactly constrain something is nice, but it doesn't get you all the way there. Um, how, the question is, how do you pick the four so they're non-redundant? Like, for instance, if you picked all four from this box, say you picked all four from this box, well, one is redundant and it won't get the right freedom space. It's like, it's like this one. Right? This one has four from the box, and, but it doesn't get the right freedom space. It would get, um, you know, this gets three degrees of freedom, whereas this one's freedom space has two degrees of freedom. Okay, so, so one would be redundant. So that's not a good way to pick your four. Well, the other thing is, do you know how many things are in just a highlighted blue plane? 
Well, whether you do or not, well, you already, if you think back when we studied blade flexures, um, you should know, right? Blade flexures, remember, um, uh, remember that example where I did a bunch of wires and I just kept adding it until I filled the whole blade in. Basically, a blade is just a big blue plane filled in with tons of blue constraint lines. Um, that's, this is a blade. A blade. Anytime you see a highlighted blue plane with, bl with blue lines that can be anywhere on that plane, just a solid blue plane, that is a blade flexure. A blade flexure can fit in there. And how many independent things are in a blade flexure? What's its order of constraint? It's three. Okay, so you already know that only three lines can lie within a filled in blue plane. Okay, so, so first of all, let me quickly review what you know here, and, and then I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Okay, so how many things lie within a disk? Well, two. Okay, how many things lie within a plane of parallel lines? Whether it's red or, or blue, it doesn't matter. If it's a plane of parallel lines, it's two. Okay, if it's a filled in plane, okay, like this blue plane, or, or there's red planes that are all filled in. There's three. It's like a blade flexure, right? Okay. What about a box of parallel lines? Well, that's only three. Okay. So so far, those are the ones you know. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, if you have interlocking disks where they share a line, you know, there's three in there. But but that's you don't need to remember, just you just need to remember how many things are contained within these subspaces, like disks, planes, boxes, and stuff. Okay. Because they're they're really going to help you if you memorize them. Okay. Okay, so, so again, getting back to this, um, this, this space here, um, we know this is the full design space. We know we have to pick four to be exactly constrained, but we know we can't pick all four from the box or it'll be redundant. And we know we can't pick all four from the plane now or it'll be like a blade flexure with another redundant wire in there. It's not going to work. Okay, so, so what sub-constraint spaces do is they, they're spaces that lie within constraint spaces and they, they come with embedded instructions about how to pick your non-redundant constraints so that they are non-redundant, so they're independent. Okay? And they, they tell you all the possible ways to do it. Okay? So this particular constraint space contains five sub-constraint spaces with five sets of instructions each, right? Um, or sorry. There's one set of instruction per each sub-constraint space. So there's five sub-constraint spaces that tell you the five different ways you can pick four constraints in here to be non-redundant. If that's super confusing, let me show you, okay? So, okay, so here's the, cons here's the constraint space. The first sub-constraint space looks like this, okay? Um, and it comes with instructions, like it says, pick three lines from the box that don't all lie in the same plane, okay? So three lines from the box that don't all lie in the same plane, and by the way, what would happen if they all lied on the same plane? Well, then it would be like those planes of parallel lines, and those only hold two. Okay, so for the th to, to access all three of the lines from the box that are independent, they have to not only be in the box, but they have to not all lie on the same plane. Of course, if you compare any two, they'll lie on a common plane, but you want the third one to not lie on that common plane so that they're independent. So, but even if you don't know that, you can just look up sub-constraint spaces um, they're all in my master's thesis, by the way, which are posted on, on my website. You go under uh, publications and thesis, you scroll all the way to the bottom, and you can see uh, my master's thesis at, at MIT um, contains all the sub-constraint space instructions. But don't worry, you, you won't ever need to go there because I'm going to teach you everything you need to know so you can deduce sub-constraint spaces, so you can do them in your sleep without ever having to look one up. But if you, if you don't understand a thing you're doing uh, and you just want to look up you know, this constraint spaces, sub-constraint spaces, know how many there are and all these things. Um, they're all in my master's thesis, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so, so the first sub-constraint space, it says, will look like this, and it'll say, pick three constraints, you know, from the box, which then saturates the box, and make sure the three lines don't all lie in the same plane. But then it says, pick one from the plane, that's your fourth one, Pick one from the plane that doesn't lie in the box. So it better not be parallel to the, any of these other ones or it just lies in the box, okay? Okay, so that's one way you could pick your four so they're non-redundant. Well, the other way you could do it is, remember, this solid plane contains three independent lines in there. So you could say, well, pick three lines from the plane, okay, but make sure they're not all parallel, 
Okay, and make sure, well, really the best way to say it is make sure they don't all intersect at the same point. Because if they all intersect at the same point, they might be on the disk, but they'd be, a, they'd be a, or sorry, they might be on the same plane, but they'd be a disk. Or if they're parallel, they'd intersect at infinity. So the best way to say it is three lines from the plane that do not all intersect at the same point. That excludes both them being all parallel, intersecting at infinity, or being a disk. So this is a, something that's acceptable. You can see these two intersect at that point, these two intersect at that point, these two intersect at that point. Those are different points. Okay. So you don't want all three that you pick to intersect the same point or it'll be a disk or a plane of parallel lines. Okay. So, but, but even if you don't know that, you can look this up and if you follow this condition, pick three from the plane that don't align on the same, you know, intersect the same point, and then one from the box that doesn't lie on the plane. Because if it lied on the plane, the fourth one you're picking would be part of the plane. Right, so pick one, okay. So you can pick three from the plane and one from the box, three from the box, one from the plane with these instructions for how to make sure they're non-redundant. Those are two of the subconstraint spaces. But another subconstraint space could say, pick two from the box, okay, that lies on a plane that intersects this highlighted plane, okay, okay, and then pick two from this plane that intersect at a point that is some distance d away. Okay, now this is, this is one that's a little tricky, and then it gives you conditions that says, you know, alpha can't be 0 or 180 degrees, it has to be somewhere between those, because then they'd all be on the plane. That one's obvious. Why d has to be non-zero is not obvious, okay, but trust me, if that point is on this intersection of those two things, and it's a disk with those things, it'll be a different constraint space. You don't know that yet, but just stick with the course, and you'll eventually learn and realize why. But even if you don't, like I said, in my, in my master's thesis, it gives you these, all these rules for this subconstraint space. Subconstraint space three here, D can't be zero. These have to be in the disk, and they have to be, you know, these can't be collinear, obviously, or they'd be just one thing. So two from this plane, two from this with these conditions. That's another way. So, but there's other ways to pick two from the box and two from the plane. You could pick two from the box that lie in a plane that, that you know, doesn't intersect this at a line in finite space. It, it would intersect a hoop or whatever. But right, so it's on a, a plane that's parallel to this plane, two from that plane, and then two from the, this plane that intersected a disk, where h is not zero, obviously, because if h were zero, it would all be on the plane. Okay, that's another way you could do it. And then the final way you could do it is to pick two from this plane that intersects this at an angle that's not zero, and two from this this highlighted plane that don't intersect at the disk but intersect at infinity, so they're parallel, and make sure this beta angle between you know the, these angles uh, of these parallel lines and this this line where they intersect is also not zero 180 degrees, or it would be in the box, right? It, it would be in the box if you did that, right? Now you might say, well, what about the case where there's two from the box but two parallel ones from this plane? Okay, that, that aren't parallel to this because it would be from the box, right? Well, trust me, that's another freedom space, okay? You don't know that yet, but you'll, you'll eventually learn. So, so trust me, these five ways, one, you know, three from the box, one from the plane, three from the plane, one from the box, two from the box, two from the plane, two from the box, two from the plane, two from the box, two from the plane, with all these different conditions, these are all the ways you can pick your four constraints from this constraint space so that they're non-redundant. Okay, so it gives you the complete picture, there's no other option. It's like, it's like there's, you know, you're, uh, maybe you guys haven't ever heard of choose your own adventure books, but it's like, you know, you, you go in and you, you choose directions and the adventure is different. You know, th this is like, once you get to this constraint space, you have five different options and the, and the, the option you pick, the sub-constraint space you pick, will dramatically affect what your design is. You can get five very different looking designs, but the cool thing is that there's just five for this constraint space and you can consider all five, you can go in all five of the Choose Your Own Adventure book doors, right? And, uh, and design very different looking designs, okay? So this fifth space with two from the plane and two from the box, okay, if you remember this one, that, that's what this one was, okay? So here, here's an exercise. So the, anyway, that's the point of sub-constraint space. They help you pick your constraints so they're non-redundant. Here's an exercise um, that I'm going to call back to what I just said here. So. Using the flexure kits, if you were in class, this is what we do. You'd build two different flexure systems that have the same degree of freedom as this one. And by, by, by the same degrees of freedom, I mean the same freedom space 
not only in appearance but in location orientation. You'd have to des you'd have to design. I'd now have you design flexures using the flexure kits that um, that achieve the same freedom space in the same location, that same orientation. Okay, um, and I say the first flexure system you'll design needs to be purely non-redundantly constrained, so exactly constrained. And the second flexure system has to have at least one redundant constraint. So it needs. So basically, I'm saying design one that's exactly constrained, design one that's over constrained that's different than this one. Okay. First, I want you to recognize though that remember we in the last example we drew the freedom space on top of it and we drew the constraint space on top of it, and we show that these two lines, vertical lines, came from the plane, and these two angled lines come from the box. Okay. Well. Um, Right. Um, well, you might recall if we go back, that's the fifth sub-constraint space. So that was one of the design kind of things that could come from this constraint space, is two parallel ones from the plane and two parallel ones from the box. And that's exactly what this is. Here's two parallel ones from this plane and two parallel ones from the box. Okay? But, but now we could go back and pick a different sub-constraint space, like, oh, let's say pick sub-constraint space two from this constraint space, and let's pick three from the plane that don't all intersect at the same point and one from the box. And that would be one way to exactly constrain it. So that's, you know, okay. So that's this example here. So you see there's a three from the plane, okay, that don't intersect at the same point, okay, and here's one from the box that's angled. That would get the exact same freedom space and the exact same um, location and orientation. And that's an exactly constrained design. And then if you want to, I said, and then design one that's over constrained, well, you can just pick a bunch of wires. You know, here we picked a fourth wire from the plane that's already over constrained. Then we picked, a, you know, a second wire from the box, and so this is over constrained by two. Okay, so this is an over constrained system. Maybe you'd want to do this to make it more symmetric, uh, to get rid of parasitic errors or something, I don't know. But, um, but anyway, that, that's an over constrained, there's two redundant constraints in there that you could design. And you could just, you just keep picking wires from the plane or from the box, and it'll just keep over constraining it, but it won't change the degrees of freedom. Okay. And again, uh, you know, I welcome you to go back and in your free time, you know, maybe maybe design different exactly constrained things from each of these five sub-constraint spaces. I, I showed you one from the fifth and one from the second, but there's there's many in the the, the first, and that might be the cleanest one. There's many in the third and the fourth and everything. And, and um, I mean, this one's a clean one, too, actually. OK. Um, this one, actually, uh, this was the one we designed, if you recall, uh, way back. Well, that's this one here. OK. So do you remember this one, where you have uh, two um, angled ones in the front? These are two ones from this plane right here. And then two parallel ones in the back. That's two, you know, and they were both on parallel planes. Remember, this example got the freedom space of this constraint space, which is the parallel red lines on the front plane. So we've already designed one using the fourth uh, sub-constraint space, whether you realize it or not. Okay. All right. So, so very good. So, anyway, I, I invite you to use these five sub-constraint spaces and, and design. Uh, five very different looking mechanisms that are exactly constrained, then add a bunch of redundant constraints to over constrain it, and you'll see they'll still get the exact same freedom space, which is, which is this guy, okay? And depending on how you orient them, you can orient the freedom space differently, okay? Okay, so there we go. So now, uh, hopefully you're ready to have your world completely rocked, okay? Because I'm about to share with you the coolest thing I've ever realized in my life. Um, and this, this, this is just still absolutely blows my mind, okay? So um, at this point, we are familiar uh, with these freedom and constraint spaces.